Good afternoon to everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gabriele Guerrini and I'm an assistant professor with the Department of Civil Engineering and Architecture at the University of Pavia in Italy. Today, uh, my presentation will be about some innovative strengthening solutions for existing masonry buildings. Now, this slide, uh, I guess, is already familiar with those of you who have followed the previous uh, uh, sessions of this uh, webinar series. Uh, this is the framework of the Eurocode 8 Part 3 for existing buildings. And uh, with today's uh, webinar, uh, we are going to focus on the last point uh, in the framework, which is the design of uh, the necessary retrofit interventions if a building is deficitary after uh, the analysis in the current state. Now, let's recall very quickly uh, how uh, a masonry building may fail the main failure modes for uh, this kind of building. First problem is the quality of the masonry. If the masonry is really poor in terms of mortar, uh, strength, uh, uh, blocks, uh, stones, uh, shape of the blocks of the stones and their interconnection, well, we may have failure of the, of the material itself. If we don't have this problem, a second level is the one related to connections because we may have out of plane collapses of portions of walls because of poor interconnections with the intersecting walls or with the diaphragms. And only if we solve these two problems or if these two problems are not present in our building, we may have a global response of the structure where the elements uh, respond in their planes, where elements are piers and spandrels of the walls. And in this case, we can take advantage of most of the strength offered by the masonry. We would ideally be in this condition and in some cases it may be necessary to strengthen our elements our peers our spandrels for the performance in the plane and this is what we are going to see mainly today now even if we provide good connections between intersecting walls and between walls and diaphragms, we may still develop some local mechanisms. In the previous uh, webinar, we saw some techniques for improving these uh, connections. But even in this case, we may see especially vertical arching of uh, uh, the masonry walls out of plane between uh, uh, floors, especially if we have uh, opening alignments, uh, if we have uh, not so good connection with intersecting walls, and if we have poorly interconnected masonry leaves within uh, the wall. But mostly, in the case of good uh, interconnection between uh, elements uh, and uh, between walls uh, and diaphragms, we may develop mechanisms in the plane of the walls, which may be classified in two main families, spandrel mechanisms, where spandrels are cracking and getting damaged, while piers uh, are uh, uh, not significantly damaged, if not at the base, because of bending, or substory mechanisms, where instead everything localizes within a story with the peers of that story getting damage in shear or uh, in bending. Now, ideally, we would like to have the first mechanism because we can spread damage and uh, deformation demand throughout the building height. But in many cases with masonry structures, we observe the soft story uh, mechanisms. If we are lucky, we can obtain what we have on the um, right hand side of the slide, where the building uh, located in Amatrice suffered the 2016 uh, August earthquake. And you can see that there all elements, all piers and all spandrels are damaged in their planes. The building had uh, improved connections between intersecting walls, uh, between walls and the floors. In that case, we can observe the result of a global response where all elements uh, were exploited with their full capacities. Now, when buildings are responding in uh, a global way, and when walls then are excited in their planes, we may have mainly three types of uh, failure modes. 
first of all, the first of them is uh, uh, bending, so a flexural mechanism, which may lead to toe crushing. Um, we may have sliding at the um, like over a flexural crack, typically at the base or at the top of a pier element, or we may develop um, diagonal shear cracks that may go through the bad joints, or they may also involve elements, especially if uh, we talk about uh, um, weak uh, blocks or uh, stone masonry. Now, the techniques, the strengthening techniques that we will see today are mainly aimed at improving both uh, performances, the out-of-plane arching uh, mechanism and the in-plane shear and flexural capacities. Now, to improve measuring quality and strength, we have some more traditional techniques which typically um, tend uh, to restore or improve the measuring quality by replacing part of the materials. For example, you may have joint repointing where uh, part uh, of, the, of the mortar joints are removed for about uh, five centimeters of so or so in depth, and uh, they are replaced with new, more performing mortars have grout injections. These are aimed at uh, filling the voids that we may have uh, within the loose uh, filling between masonry leaves. Other techniques are aimed instead at uh, fixing cracks, pre-existing cracks in our walls. One of them is masonry stitching. In this case, we remove the uh, damaged portion of the masonry and we replace it with new masonry uh, in, of course, uh, intact with uh, with no cracks. Or another solution might be to um, adopt a reinforced uh, repointing uh, method, where the uh, joint repointing is associated with the insertion of uh, steel bars, uh, helicoidal bars, uh, materials that can resist tension and, and that can bridge the existing crack. Or we may aim at uh, in improving the tensile strength of the masonry material just by adding reinforcement within slots, like uh, in the top uh, right uh, photo. In that case, the intervention is um, the insertion of vertical reinforcing elements. It can be steel or composite bars or plates. And also, we may want to connect together the masonry leaves throughout the thickness of the wall. In this case, there are several techniques uh, that can be adopted. The one I'm showing here is, uh, uh, is called reinforced uh, injection uh, with uh, grouted post-tension ties, for example. This is a possible solution for, uh, for this problem. But what we are going to focus today are other methods that are based on adding material overlays. Now, traditionally, mm, we have the um, adoption of reinforced plaster. This has been used in Italy at least quite extensively in some regions, especially in central Italy, starting from the 70s, I would say. And also in the 90s or so, another technique became popular, which was based on the application of the fiber reinforced polymers or FRPs. Now, these techniques have evolved in the three that we see at the bottom, and they are the use of uh, uh, composite meshes instead of steel meshes for the reinforced plaster. And this technique is called composite reinforced mortars. We have also fabric reinforced cementation matrices or, or FRCM. Uh, this is the evolution of uh, uh, FRP overlays. And finally, we have a technique that is based on timber material, again, connected to the masonry surface, which we will see in today's presentation acts very similarly from a certain point of view to the CRM or the FRCM uh, strengthening method. So let's begin talking about uh, CRM and FRCM strengthening. With uh, CRM or composite reinforced mortar, 
uh, we, we mean a strengthening technique which has a thickness greater than 30 millimeters as opposed to the FRCN uh, materials which have a thickness uh, less than or equal to 30 millimeters. So this is one of the main differences between these two types of uh, uh, interventions. CRM, as I was saying, is an evolution of the traditional reinforced plaster because we are replacing the steel uh, welded wire mesh with uh, um, FRP, often type of oftentimes um, GFRP mesh, but it could be also a carbon FRP or aramidic FRP mesh. What is the advantage in doing so? Well, steel typically has problems with durability, which requires great thickness to protect the steel reinforcement from corrosion. When we use an FRP uh, mesh, instead we can reduce this thickness because we don't have this uh, corrosion problem on the other hand, FRCMs are the evolution of FRPs. Now, in this case, one problem with the adoption of FRP is the lack of compatibility, material, chemical compatibility, between the epoxy resins that are used to form the FRP and uh, uh, the old masonry layer uh, where this material is applied. Now, by replacing the polymeric uh, matrix, the epoxy matrix, with um, cementitious or, in some cases, um, hydraulic lime mortar, we can achieve a better uh, compatibility between the new and the old uh, materials. In both cases, the uh, intervention can improve the out of plane um, response of these walls, especially uh, against the vertical arching, thanks to uh, the vertical fibers or yarns or bar, if we, have, if we talk about a, a composite mesh. We may also improve the in plane response of uh, um, the masonry elements. If we look at the pier, uh, the vertical uh, fibers or bars uh, can improve the flexural uh, response uh, of the element provided they are anchored top and bottom into the nodal regions or to the floors and foundation. But the horizontal components of the mesh or of the textile will provide um, strength against uh, shear. So we can improve both types of response uh, in the plane of the element. So we can basically say that uh, adding a CRM or an FRCM overlay to a masonry element is like adding an external reinforcement as these materials have tensile strength. So it's like adding external reinforcement uh, to the existing unreinforced masonry now, here at the University of Pavia, we have performed a quite extensive uh, campaign on the strengthening of um, stone masonry with uh, both CRM and FRCM solutions. We have performed a lot of diagonal compression tests on uh, bare stone masonry and on uh, a number of like uh, 33 uh, jacketed uh, wallets uh, where we employed basically 11 different combinations of uh, uh, materials to form uh, CRM or uh, FRCM and uh, um, this allowed us to investigate uh, the increment in the masonry tensile strength or in an equivalent let's say masonry tensile strength uh, uh, due to the strengthening system. Now, this is a quite a simplified approach to treat the problem uh, because in reality, it's not simply increasing the tensile strength of mason, it's like adding reinforcement, as I was saying. But uh, um, there are uh, design guidelines in the Italian code and in the uh, upcoming uh, um, edition of the Eurocode 8 part three, uh, where we can treat uh, this intervention like an incremented tensile strength of the masonry with a with an, a magnifying factor. Then we performed a cyclic shear compression test on two jacketed piers, and in this case, we wanted to investigate actually how not the strength of the material, the masonry material, but how the 
lateral strength of the element uh, was increasing thanks to this intervention and especially how much the lateral displacement capacity was affected by the intervention. As I said, we investigated uh, these, uh, um, these uh, interventions uh, when applied to stone uh, masonry walls uh, with a thickness of 300 millimeters, uh, quite weak uh, masonry. And these walls were made of two uh, independent leaves, poorly interconnected uh, without uh, through stones and with a filling between the leaves made of a mix of uh, mortar and stone scraps. Then we characterized uh, our uh, masonry material using vertical compression test and diagonal compression test in order to uh, find out, first of all, the uh, strength and the elastic constants for the bare uh, material as listed here uh, in, this, uh, in this table. So then we can express the equivalent increment of tensile strength from the diagonal compression test with a reference to this FT0 of 0.14 megapascals of tensile strength of the bare stone masonry. So, diagonal compression tests were performed on one by one meter square specimens loaded over compression along a diagonal and uh, were able to record the maximum force resisted by the specimens. The type of uh, um, strengthening that was adopted was either CRM or FRCM. For CRM systems, we had nine different combinations uh, using uh, uh, several types of mortars of uh, GFRP mesh and uh, connector type and distribution. I'm not going to list all of them, but we try to investigate the uh, effect of these different uh, uh, parameters. For the FRCN systems, we had two combinations, basically one using uh, perimetral strips of monodirectional textile, the other one using a, a bidirectional textile applied to the entire sur surface uh, of the wallet. And this is what you obtain. So here you can say you can see how we determine the tensile strength, basically considering uh, uh, more circles and starting from the applied load P, we were able to define the um, principal tensile stress and when p reached its maximum value that principal stress was the tensile strength of the material and we can see that with the different crm methods uh, we reached uh, um, tensile strength increments uh, ranging between 2.3 and 3.3 so on average we can say a 2.8 uh, factor or so with the FRCM solutions, this increment was a little bit less. We talk about uh, values between 1.9 and 2.4, so let's say 2.2 times. But this is, as I was saying, a simplified way of approaching uh, uh, the problem. If we want to get more information on the effect of these strengthening techniques on masonry elements, not just on masonry materials, we need to uh, follow a different path. We need to perform uh, in plane uh, tests, uh, in, uh, shear compression. In this case, the tests were cyclic uh, and the forces uh, were applied uh, quasi statically, meaning that we didn't have uh, any significant uh, dynamic uh, effect. This is the test setup. Basically, uh, our specimen was loaded with three actuators, two vertical, one horizontal, to control the applied uh, vertical force, uh, to control the boundary condition at the top of the specimen with the vertical actuators, and with the horizontal actuator, applying uh, lateral cycles of force and uh, displacement. The uh, specimens uh, included uh, for both cases of CRM and FRCM strengthening, uh, 1.2 by 1.5 meter pier, and also portions of the top and bottom spandrels, because we wanted uh, to be able to anchor 
the uh, CRM and the FRCM uh, materials within the nodal regions between the peer and the spenders. So to exploit them and explore their effect also on the flexural response of the peer. The masonry was the same as investigated with the diagonal compression tests, uh, same uh, mortar, same stones, uh, and same thickness of 300 millimeters. So, uh, for the CRM solution, one of the different combinations investigated with the diagonal compression test was chosen. Uh, a hydraulic line mortar of M15 class was uh, selected. The mesh was a rectangular GFRP mesh with uh, um, uh, a weight of 400 grams per square meter and uh, helicoidal uh, connectors were adopted to, um, to connect the strengthening to the uh, masonry substrate. And uh, this is important to know, we'll, we'll see uh, in a while, the pier was strengthened with eight uh, connectors. So this dense distribution was probably uh, important for the success of this strengthening. In the case of the FRCM, which was applied to specimen P2, uh, we used a cement-based M20 class uh, mortar uh, reinforced with glass fibers, and we adopted the bidirectional textile, uh, which had a weight of 22 grams per square meter of uh, PBO, which is a synthetic fiber, in each uh, direction. And in this case, the connectors were also made of PBO, as shown here in the figure. You can see uh, the end of the connector uh, applied uh, and spread it onto the surface of the FRCM, where it's uh, bonded uh, with, uh, with a mortar. Now, in this case, the distribution of connectors was less dense. Over the pier, we had only five uh, connectors. And this may be the cause of the a little bit less satisfactory performance of this uh, um, strengthening compared to the CRM for this specific uh, uh, testing campaign. Now, um, we kept constant uh, the axial force to reach at the base of the pier 25% of the masonry axial strength. We tested our uh, specimens in double curvature curvature conditions, meaning that uh, the top uh, spandrel was not allowed to rotate uh, while it was displacing laterally. And we applied lateral uh, forces and displacement in cycles of uh, three uh, per increment. And these are the uh, lateral force displacement responses that we obtained for the two specimens, for the CRN strengthened specimen P1 and FRCN strengthened specimen P2. Now, in the case of uh, the CRN strengthening, we uh, had a response governed by flexure all the way to the end of the test with an um, extensive toe crashing at the corners of the pier, while with the FRCM, uh, the failure of the specimen was controlled by diagonal shear cracking. So uh, with, the, um, with the CRM system, we were able to uh, increase by a factor of 1.5 the lateral shear strength of the, of the element, uh, compared to what we expected for the same peer without any strengthening uh, uh, system, while the ultimate drift ratio, uh, that is the lateral displacement divided by the height of the peer, 1.5 meters, uh, was like 2.5% when the strength dropped by 20%. This is more than three times the limit that we find in EC8 for unreinforced uh, masonry, that is 0.8%. Instead, for specimen P2, where we applied the FRCM strengthening, I said uh, failure was controlled by diagonal shear failure. This happened likely because the um, FRCM layers detached from the masonry surface. And this is why I was saying maybe having here only five uh, connectors as opposed to the eight connectors for the CRM, maybe this led to this type of failure. So, the, 
a jacket detached from, uh, from the surface of the masonry. And at this point, uh, um, the masonry failed, uh, uh, failed in shear, in diagonal shear. In any case, the strength increment compared to the um, predicted strength of the unreinforced masonry pier uh, was 1.4 times, almost the same as we obtained with the CRM. You can see this. And in this case, the ultimate drift ratio, again, at a 20% strength drop, was 1.5%. So it's actually four times the limit that we would find in EC8 for an unreinforced masonry pier failing each year. For this case, uh, the Eurocode uh, gives a limit uh, of 0.4%. Now, in both cases, again, we can say that the response was uh, like the one of a reinforced masonry elements, uh, both in terms of strength and displacement capacity, provided that detachment uh, of the of the strengthening system is prevented, especially for the flexural uh, response. Now, this is uh, what happens uh, when um, connection between the strengthening and the masonry substrate fails. You can see on the left hand side. Uh, uh, the case of a uh, wallet subjected to diagonal compression with only one uh, through connector in the center of the panel. You can see that we have separation of the masonry leaves, uh, which are not uh, held uh, together by, by, the, by the connectors. On the right hand side, we see what happened to peer. Um, P2, the one strengthened with FRCM, because of the uh, not so dense distribution of connectors, you can see buckling and detachment of the FRCM layer here. And after this happened, well, at the end of the test, we removed completely the FRCM and we exposed the misery here. You can see diagonal cracks, which are definitely telling us that the peer failed in diagonal uh, shear. So again, connecting the strengthening to the masonry is, of course, of very, very big importance. So let's move now to the timber strengthening. Now, the solution that we have developed here at the University of Pavia and at Hughes Center Foundation is based on the application of a timber frame to one side of the masonry wall, then to nail uh, oriented strand board or OSB panels to this timber frame and again of important, you know, very big importance, connecting all this retrofitting system to the masonry by mechanical connections. Um, I mean, what we will uh, say next, uh, the most important connections are the ones at the base and at the top of the pier, the ones that you can see here and here. These are the tie down connections uh, labeled also C1. And these basically provide continuity between the vertical timber posts and uh, um, the floors uh, uh, of the structure, allowing uh, to develop a flexural contribution from the strengthening system. Without this type of connection, we wouldn't be able to take advantage of uh, the, the retrofit in terms of flexural strength because we wouldn't have continuity at the top and at the base uh, of the pier. Now, as with uh, uh, CRM and FRCM systems, also with this timber retrofit, uh, we can uh, um, increase the out-of-plane capacity of the walls. In this case, we can just take advantage of the post as simply supported beams uh, pinned at the top and at the bottom. Uh, and uh, with their flexural strength, they can just resist the inertial load coming from uh, the masonry, which can be considered just as a weight uh, without considering its contribution to the, to the strength. Uh, instead, um, what concerns the in-plane response uh, of the retrofit, in this case, it's very important, as I was saying, to considering the effect of the connection between the vertical posts and the top and bottom floors or the foundation in order to um, take advantage of the flexural contribution of the, of the retrofit. 
while the nay of the USB sheathing can be uh, considered effective in adding a component to the shear uh, resistance. In this case, the experimental campaign included a cyclic shear compression test on one bare and one retrofitted uh, peers and two dynamic shake table tests, one on a bare uh, masonry building, the other one on a on the same building, a building with the same geometry and same characteristic, but strengthened. In this case, the masonry was a calcium silicate brick masonry with a cement mortar. This is typically found in Northern Europe. And the masonry was a single leaf with very, very thin walls, only 10 centimeters. And as before, the masonry was characterized with appropriate uh, uh, material tests in order to obtain its uh, compressive, tensile, and uh, shear strength properties, as well as the elastic constant. I mean, in this case, let's look directly at the cyclic shear compression test on peers. The setup is very similar, but in this case, we didn't have uh, spandrels uh, uh, connected to the peer. We just uh, looked uh, at the connection between the peer and the uh, what would be a foundation and a top floor just by connecting it to the footing and to the uh, top reinforced concrete beam, uh, which are part of the testing uh, setup. Uh, you can see here how thin, how slender was uh, this pier. Only 10 centimeters uh, thick and 2.7 meters uh, high. And these same dimensions apply to the uh, bare and to the retrofitted uh, specimens. The posts uh, and nogging of the strengthening system uh, were made of red solid fear, while OSB panels of uh, category OSB3 were uh, applied to the, to the frame and nailed to it. The tie-down connections uh, had a characteristic tensile strength of 11.6 kN. Again, these are very important in order to uh, uh, obtain a contribution to the flexural strength. Uh, in this case, the axial load applied to the system was able to reach 5.4% of the masonry compressive strength. Double curvature boundary conditions were also considered, and a similar protocol in terms of lateral force displacement cycles was followed as seen before. And here we can see the response of the bare URM peer and the retrofitted peer. Now, in the case of the um, unreinforced uh, element, uh, we developed a sliding shear mechanism, which uh, led uh, to the failure of the, of the specimen, while when we applied the timber retrofit, uh, the um, failure mode was mainly related to toe crushing, and only at the very end of the test, uh, we developed diagonal cracks, probably also due to the reduced section because of toe crushing, over which uh, all forces were transferred. And what we can see is that with the retrofit system, we increased the, the lateral strength by about uh, a factor of 1.35. So the reinforced, uh, the strengthened specimen was 35% stronger than the unretrofitted one. Again, we changed the failure mode. We didn't allow shear sliding to happen because all the mechanical connections, which are part of the retrofit solution, and instead we develop a toe crashing mechanism followed by diagonal uh, shear cracking, reaching an ultimate drift ratio, a 20% strength drop of 2%, as opposed to the 0.75% of the uh, unreinforced masonry pier. And this means that the displacement capacity was 2.6. 2.67 times the one of the uh, bare specimen, which is a huge increment. Again, as with the other two retrofit techniques, we can say that our retrofitted peer behaves more or less like a reinforced masonry element, provided that mechanical connections are actually uh, working and connecting uh, the retrofit to the peer and to the rest of the masonry structure. An important aspect here is that the timber frame can also help the masonry in carrying vertical loads when the masonry is significantly damaged, for example, uh, upon toe crashing. And here we can see at the top 
what happened to the uh, unreinforced the masonry specimen in the bottom, what happened to the strength and specimen at different uh, um, lateral uh, drift uh, ratios. So basically, you see uh, they're vertical, vertically aligned in terms of equal or nearly equal uh, lateral drift ratios. Uh, you can see that the retrofitted pier developed significant toe crashing with loss of masonry. And this is why I'm saying it's important to connect um, well the masonry to the um, timber. For example, if you provide more um, connectors between the post and the masonry uh, at the edges of the, of the element, we can avoid the loss of that masonry. But in any case, the timber frame was able to resist the vertical loads that were not taken anymore by the masonry. Now you can see that 2% drift ratio is at the very end of the, of the test. You see the section here is significantly reduced almost to half the initial one. And probably this is what induced this cracking here where kind of the misery was basically falling apart with these diagonal uh, cracks that might be related to the transfer of shear along this uh, diagonal. Important is also to see what happened and the, um, the tie down connections here at the base, you can see this buckled uh, L shaped connector. This is the response of the connector in its uh, elongation. So the vertical displacement, uh, local vertical displacement here measured by this potentiometer against the horizontal displacement. You can see that this um, region, this element is shortening progressively as we go on with the test. Uh, this shortening is uh, related also to the loss of masonry in this region and the fact that all this timber is carrying the load and is basically punching through the bottom seal plate here and this connector is buckling because of this uh, uh, imposed uh, uh, axial compressive deformation. We also performed, as I was saying, dynamic shake table test on two buildings, identical geometries, identical materials, one just uh, unreinforced masonry the other one with the retrofit applied and combined with uh, uh, diaphragm uh, strengthening so um, the building had a uh, timber diaphragm at the second floor and that was also stiffened with uh, osb panels now let's compare their response uh, at the same level of shaking intensity the ground motion that was chosen was compatible uh, with what is expected uh, in the Netherlands region of Groningen, where they have a problem with induced uh, seismicity due to gas extraction. So it's not a long uh, natural earthquake. It's a very short uh, earthquake, but for um, this uh, type of construction may cause some damage. Now, here we went to 133% of the um, of the intensity associated with the 2,500 years return period. And uh, I will show you now the video. We can see that the unretrofitted building is quite damaged in this region. We have sliding here at the top, cracking here at the bottom of the second story, where all the damage is concentrated. Well, under the same shaking intensity, the retrofitted building is basically moving all together. Nothing is actually happened, just small displacements, but uh, no concentrated mechanism, no localized mechanisms, no localized damage. And we were able to push the uh, retrofitted specimen to twice as much the intensity and here you can see that the, most of the damage was related to the loss of this window here that fell down actually the interior leaf of the misery which is the load bearing one was quite damaged uh, at some point but uh, in any case the building was able to develop a global mechanism taking advantage of, uh, uh, of the measurement strength, it damaged the piers at the ground floor of this building. Now, to conclude this uh, presentation, I just want to show you some analogies between these three strengthening systems. Why that? Well, um, there are some guidelines that are uh, 
published by the National Research Council of, it of Italy. They're published also in English, and they can be used as a reference for the um, design of uh, um, FRCN strengthening. Uh, we don't have at the moment uh, um, design guidelines for CRM and for the timber system, but I will show you that these uh, systems behave similarly to each other. And so we can take advantage of an, of an analogy to find equivalent parameters for an equivalent FRCM system that uh, will represent somehow either the CRM or the timber uh, retrofit. This can also be used if you want to implement this kind of retrofit in uh, uh, softwares. For example, Tremuri offers the possibility of uh, including uh, um, an FRCM retrofit in the, in the building. And taking advantage of this analogy, you can actually define an equivalent FRCM that you can introduce in the model so to um, see or at least uh, have an idea of the uh, more or less uh, uh, evident effect of the retrofit that you would like to design. So you can see that the actual flexural strength uh, enhancement is due to the vertical fibers I highlighted here in red in the FRCM system, or the vertical bars of the uh, composite mesh of the CRM retrofit, or by the tie down connections C1 of the timber system. Again, remember that in the timber system, the strength of the vertical pose is actually limited at the connection level by the C1 connection, which is usually weaker than the post. So that's controlling as they are in, uh, in series, that controls the force that can go uh, into the post uh, due to flexure. For shear, instead, the horizontal fibers here in blue of the FRCM are contributing, as well as the horizontal bars of the composite mesh in the CRM system and the nailed OSB layer uh, of the timber retrofit. So we can set up analogies between, this, uh, between these components again, to transform one into the other one and be able to follow either the design guidelines or to implement uh, these uh, solutions in a numerical model. Again, we'll make reference to this document, the CNR DT215-2018 uh, of the National Research Council of Italy, which addresses the design of FRCM retrofit. There are some parameters required uh, in the equations, they are nothing but the equations of the mm, flexural contribution of a distributed uh, reinforcement. But be careful, a brittle reinforcement that cannot plasticize. And the, the equations of an additional shear contribution uh, for what concerns the uh, lateral shear resistance. Now, you can see this parameter BF here is the width of the strengthening on the pier. For the analogy, we can just say that BF is equal to the overall uh, width of the, of the element, which is H. So we can just set this. There are some coefficients, uh, alpha T and F, that we can just take equal to one for our analogy, doesn't matter. And we can also select an arbitrary value for this thickness, T to F. This is the overall equivalent uh, thickness of the FRCM uh, uh, strengthening. Now, we are trying to find equivalent properties, so whatever value we adopt for this uh, is going to be fine because all other parameters will depend on our choice for this value. Now, the first equivalence that we consider is the one between the axial rigidity of the vertical uh, fibers of the FRCM and the one of the vertical bars of the CRM or the C1 connections of the timber retrofit. By setting up this equivalence, we can find these equations here. So the value of the elastic modulus of the equivalent FRCM fibers that uh, we have to uh, consider is based on the actual elastic modulus of the composite mesh or of the steel used for the connectors, and depends on the overall areas, of course, either of the mesh for CRM or 
uh, overall area of all the connectors uh, at one interface for uh, our um, timber system. The other equivalence that we need to consider is the one between the total axial strength provided by the vertical fibers of the FRCM and the one of the vertical bars of the CRM or uh, the tie down connectors of the timber retrofit. Since we have already set up this first equivalence that led us to the value of EF and we have fixed other parameters, T2F and H, basically, this translates into equating the design uh, ultimate uh, tensile, um, tensile strain of the um, FRCM fibers to the one of the mesh for the CRM or the one of the steel for uh, the connectors in the timber solution. And this is what concerns the flexural strength. Now, moving to the shear strength, all these three solutions are basically adding a shear strength contribution to the original shear strength of the URM pier. So simply, we equate mm, the uh, value of our additional shear strength calculated for uh, whatever mm, solution we have chosen to the one that is given in this uh, CNR document for uh, the FRCM retrofit, and we can find this equivalent parameter, NF, TVF. This is basically the overall equivalent thickness of the CRM effective in, uh, in shear. So again, by doing this, we can just transform again our CRM or uh, timber retrofit into an equivalent FRCM uh, strengthening uh, solution. And by doing this, again, we can take advantage of these guidelines. Uh, as at the moment, we don't have guidelines specific for CRM and for the timber retrofit. And also, we can take advantage of uh, uh, modeling techniques that are already available, for example, in Tremuri, to model uh, this uh, FRCM or FRCM equivalent uh, solution uh, in our uh, three-dimensional building. Now, these are some references for uh, what I presented uh, today. And with this, I've concluded my, my presentation. I hope uh, you have enjoyed it.